from verse 17 to 22. Exodus 30, verse 17 to 22. Exodus 30, verse 17 to 22. Let us read. The Lord said to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base of bronze for washing, and you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die, or when they approach the altar to minister, by sacrificing up in smoke of fire, sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 21. So they shall wash their hands and feet so that they shall will not die, and it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. Amen. So this is the east gate and that is the doorway that is the entrance to the temple if you open through this door the first thing first place you will encounter is the altar where they do burnt sacrifices passing the altar there is the there's the tent there's a tent of meeting and right in front of the tent of meeting there is a place to wash their hands so in order to enter the tent of meeting you have to pass the place where you wash your hands you have to to go to the tent of meeting you pass the altar you you wash through the you pass through the door, number one, you pass through the altar, number two, and you pass through the place to wash, number three, and then you are able to enter the tent of meeting, which has the the holy place and the holy of holies. So first, let us talk about the workings of the bronze wash basin. Why is this necessary? What is the purpose of it? So for a high priest to be able to enter the tent of meeting, what did God say? To wash their hands and feet. Wash their hands and feet. We have to think about this. When they made the tent of meeting... They made the tent of meeting when they were in the wilderness. So because they were working in a place like a tent in the wilderness, of course, your wa your hands and feet will get dirty because there's dust and there's sand. Your hands and feet will get dirty. So it's not like a place like New Jersey or Manhattan, like there are cities that is not where God said to make a tent in these kind of urbanized and developed places. No, in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, there's nothing. There's just dirt and sand and dust. Because there's this dust, our hand, their hands and feet obviously would get dirty. So that is why before they did their duty as priests, the high priest had to wash their hands and feet. God told them to wash their hands and feet. If they did not wash their hands and feet, they could die. That is why the decree was given.
And secondly, in Solomon's temple, this was also used as a place to to wash the offerings. Let us turn to First First Chronic First Chronicles four verse six. First Chronic. Oh, okay. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 4 verse 6. Second Chronicles 4 verse 6. Let us read all together. Second Chronicles 4 verse 6. He also made ten basins in which to wash. And he set five on the right side and five on the left to rinse things for the burnt offering. But the sea was for the priests to wash in. In the Temple of Solomon, there were ten water basins. There were five on the right and five on the left. Why did he make ten? To be able to wash the offerings. It's not just like any other kind of things that we have. They're the offerings. They are meant to be sacrificed. So that is why these ten basins were built, five on each side. So the most important reason for the basins is to wash, is to wash things. Because they put water in it, it's to wash things. So for the high priest, in, in order to be able to enter, they wash their hands and feet. If they did not wash their hands and feet, then they could die. And in the time of Solomon... In the Temple of Solomon, they also washed sacrifices, animals. They washed their offerings with the in, at these basins. So secondly, a specific characteristic and the redemptive lesson from these water basins. So the characteristics and redemptive lessons from the water basins. The first is the material. First point, small point, is about the material. So the material, in order to be able to scoop and use the water, what did they use? They made it out of bronze. In chapter 30, verse 18, it says, Exodus 30, verse 18, it says, that they were made of bronze. But more specifically, they were made by mirrors. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 38, verse 8. Exodus 38, verse 8. Exodus 38, verse 8. Moreover, he made the laver of bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving woman who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So saying that they're made of bronze and also made of mirrors, what does this mean? The mirrors that we think of are like, they are not the kind of mirrors that we think of today in the Old Testament times but they were not made of ordinary bronze or not made of ordinary mirrors either Mirrors made of glass are different, but before, in the past, there was no glass. So instead, they used bronze mirrors. And you could see your reflection through the bronze. So when they scooped the water, 
So these bronze was actually like bronze mirrors. So there are two important lessons that we can see from these bronze mirrors. The first is the lesson of it's the blessing of uh, devotion commitment so women in the past they were very attracted to these bronze mirrors and they were very admired amongst women at the time why when God chose to make places to use water why did they use, why did God use the same material of bronze mirror the same things that women liked what is it representing to showing to us even the things that we think the most highly of we have to offer it to God that is the point that is the lesson of devotion of commitment of dedication when we dedicate ourselves to God then the dedication that we can do that make God happy is when we give up the things that we love the most, the things that we cherish the most. When we give it to God, then this dedication has meaning, has very deep meaning. There was a story that uh, they spent 300 money on a perfume and used it for Jesus. It would be a very big amount. It's a very large amount today. Also, other things were broken and used. Other precious things that were used. So, Mary dedicated herself by, by giving everything, almost basically everything that she owned. Not giving something that you have already used and then giving it to God. That's not much meaning to that. But if we give the most precious things that we own to God, then that is a very big, that is a very big uh, offering, and God thinks very highly of it. So it is also showing that we should not um, try to be uh, frugal, not try to keep everything for ourselves and spend lightly, but to give what we have. And to give it well. As we said before, the material used to make the water basins are bronze mirrors. And because they're made from mirrors, in the bronze mirrors, in the basins, you can see yourself. Even though it may not be clear, you can still see yourself. So if you see your, your scattered reflection, it also works as a mirror. So this water basin, because it's working as like a mirror, let our congregation members also have a mirror to reflect in as well. And that mirror can be the mirror of the word. Let us turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James 1 verse 23. James 1 verse 23. Let us read all together. For if anyone for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has imme immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effect, effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The mirror, it, re it represents the law, but someone who looks intently at the law, you will be able to truly reflect on what you are and what you do. When What is the reason that we look at a mirror? In the morning we wake up from sleep. We look at the mirror. Why do we look at the mirror? 
to see our our scattered and uh, messy selves. But some people look in the mirror, they see their messy hair, their face is a mess. But after they look in the mirror, they try to fix it. But if you don't look at it right away and then you you don't fix it and you go outside, then you lose the purpose of looking at the mirror if you forget about it. The mirror is the re is is there for us to be able to see the things that are messy for the things that we have, the things that we do, the things that we think that are messy. And the mirror is like God's law that allows us to reflect on it. As we read the Bible, we can find ourselves, "Oh, I can't live like this." I have to live with God's meaning. I, I did not follow God's meaning properly. And I'm going on a wrong way. If you've understood this, then we have to fix it. We have to fix it. And that is why the Bible, the God's Word, is is doing the, the work of like a of a mirror. The Bible has two purposes, as I've explained before. The Bible or the Word. does the duty does the job of a mirror and secondly it does the mirror it does the job of glass and it does the job of a mirror of a window the word does the job of a window and a mirror what does a window do it allows us to look outside to see the world how are we supposed to look out and see the world we have to look out in the world with god's point of view we have to wear the eye the glasses of the bible to and see, look outside and then we can see the world in God's eyes. And then we can read and understand the world. But the Bible is not only used as a window, it's also used as a mirror. So when we read the Bible, the Bible is a mirror to us. So we can see ourselves in the mirror, right? So when we read the Bible, we can see ourselves as well. And when we find ourselves in the Bible, when we see things that we need to fix, things that are wrong, then we need to change it. We need to fix it. And that is why the Bible, the Word, is not only a mirror, and is not only a window, but also a mirror. In the Old Testament, when we read all these mistakes and sins and things that they did wrong, there are so many things that they did in the Old Testament we can find. If we look in the Bible as a, as a mirror, after we read about these things, we cannot curse at them. We have to also apply these this point of view to ourselves as well. Our wrongdoings, our sins, our mistakes. We also have to reflect on ourselves as well. As well. And we have to fix it. So then our lives will change. So the Bible not only does the job of a, of a window, but also as a mirror. So the high priest before they entered the temple because they were made of bronze mirrors they were able to look upon themselves and see if there was any messy parts or things that they need to clean up or fix up and they can do so through the bronze mirrors that the women used so point number two so the second characteristic that we need to consider is the water so the basin is something like this and inside what is there there's water because before the priests entered they washed their hands and feet so therefore they need water what kind of role does water do Water represents God's word. Water represents God's word. Let's turn to Ephesians 5 verse 26. Ephesians 5 verse 26. Ephesians 5 verse 26 so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word of course it's translated kind of difficultly but I'm going to try to re-explain re it once again 
So if they just like being washed with the water, being washed with the word makes them clean as well. When we are physically dirty, what do we use? We used water. We use water to clean ourselves. So yesterday at my house, the water turned to dirty water and I couldn't shower and I couldn't wash my face. So we came to church and we showered. Wow. Our house, the water, some weird water started coming out. It was very uncomfortable for us. When we are physically dirty, we use water to clean ourselves. But when our heart and soul is dirty, do we use water? No, we use the Word, the Word of God. Because the Word of God has the same principles like water. Ephesians 5 verse 26, we can see, cleansed her with the washing of water like with the word with the word so we made ourselves clean we made ourselves holy with the word cleaning ourselves with the word so the water represents god's word let us read john 15 verse 3 john 15 verse 3 You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So the word of God does the same as water. Our spiritual selves, which cannot be cleansed with water, are cleansed clean with the word of God instead. Before the high priest entered the temple, they washed their hands and feet with water in the new testament the new testament priest represents who the people who believe in jesus and are saved us when our spiritual hands and feet are dirty and our hearts are dirty what can we wash ourselves with we can wash ourselves with god's word so when our hearts are not at ease and there are a lot of issues and things and darkness in our hearts let listen to god's word and then we will be at peace and our heart will become clean and there will be peace in our hearts. God's word is like water that can clean our spiritual selves. And it has that kind of power. And small point number two. Water represents the repentance of believers. In John 13, if you look, there's the instant the event of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. This was after following doing dinner, then Jesus washed the feet. But Peter says how can you wash our feet, teacher? We need to wash your feet. But what does Jesus say? Let us read John 13, verse 8. John 13, verse 8. John 13, verse 8. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. It's a very scary word. If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. So Peter was scared. So he said, Don't wash only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And then what did Jesus say? It's a very important word. In John 13 verse 10. Let us read John 13 verse 10. Verse 10. Let us read all together. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. But not all of you. So if we look here, we can see Jesus. There's bathing. Washing was divided into two things. First, there was bathing. 
and first there's and second there's washing feet. So cleaning is divided into two things, bathing and washing your feet. Peter asked not only to wash his feet, but also his hands and his head. But Jesus said, "Those he who has bathed only needs to wash his feet. There are those who bathe and those who have to wash their feet. So being bathed, what does this mean? What does the bathing that Jesus Christ mean? It means when we are saved, When we are saved, we have received a complete bathing. We've bathed our entire body. So this this bathing and this bathing is something that you only do once. It is our rebirth. All of our sins are forgiven. But even though we have washed bathe, when we come in at night, don't we wash our feet at least? So this washing feet represents repentance. And this is a continual repentance. So looking at it from the tabernacle, so the altar represents Jesus Christ. So this complete bathing results from the altar which represents Jesus Christ. We have been completely bathed. Our sins have been completely forgiven because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. But as we live our lives, as we live our lives day by day, our feet get dirty. So when we come home, we wash our feet. Similarly, as all of our sins have been forgiven through the bathing, if we live our lives day by day, because we sin knowingly and not knowingly, we have to repent all the time. We have to wash our feet all the time. From the moment we believe in Jesus, we, we receive this, this, this bathing, this cleansing of all our sins. But then we need to continually repent. It's not that we... We don't need to repent anymore because we have been continually washed. We still continually get dirty, so we need to continually wash our feet, which represents repentance. We need to continually repent. But Jesus says an important word here. He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet but is and is completely clean and you are clean but not all of you so the disciples had all already bathed that's why all they need to do is wash their feet because they have already received salvation through Jesus on the cross they have already received salvation but as we live our lives there are times when we commit sins that we do not know of but Jesus didn't say everyone was clean only some were clean and others were not who is he talking about among the disciples, who is he talking about? Judas Iscariot, of course. Let us read verse 11. John 13, verse 11. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. If you look here, Judas Iscariot, did he receive salvation or no? Judas, did he receive salvation or no? Did he receive the rebirth? Did he receive the forgiveness of sins? He didn't. How did we know? All the priests, all the disciples are clean, but not one. Excluding who? Judas. Because Judas is not someone who has been bathed. Once again, he did not receive the forgiveness of sins and the rebirth. That is why Jesus said he is dirty. He knows he is the one who will betray him. He knows how can he be washed by Jesus? The surprising truth is that Judas Iscariot never, not once, called him Lord. Judas never called Jesus Lord. He only called him Rabbi, 
but Judas Iscariot never called Jesus Lord. So Judas Iscariot was someone who was never saved. He never received salvation. So he did not receive the spiritual bathing like the other disciples. So in washing, there are two main points. There's bathing, which is receiving salvation. When we receive rebirth and we all our sins are forgiven, then we have a complete bathing of our body, then all sins are forgiven. But after amount of time we need, still need to continually wash our feet because it continually gets dirty like our feet get dirty so we need to repent because we still continually sin so water is what water is God's word and water is con represents continual repentance continual repentance so even though they are priests before they entered the temple they completely washed themselves so it's showing to us that we need to continually repent as well. That is what is teaching us. And point number three. Let us turn to Peter. And num point number three is us receiving baptism. First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three verse twenty one. First Peter three verse twenty one. First Peter three verse twenty one. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. When we are baptized, what are we baptized with? Is this a hard question? When we are baptized, we baptize with water, right? We baptize with water. Being baptized means you're becoming God's children. You're God's people. It's a sign. In the Old Testament, what was the sign that you are God's people? In the Old New Testament, it changed to baptism. Oh, in the in the beginning, in the Old Testament, the sign of being God's chosen people was circumcision. So in Matthew 3 or these other places we look in the Bible, when John the Baptist baptized people, he baptized in the Jordan River. First they went in the water. First went in the water and then came out. That is the original way we're supposed to do baptism. But we cannot go into a lake or a water body, body of water to baptize. So that is why we just at church have a little water on our hands and we pray for them. But if we were be baptized in the original way we have to enter the water it's a different meaning when you enter the water it means we have died with Jesus when you go into the water, it means we have died with Jesus. That is what it represents. You are, in, you die in the water with Jesus. You die in the water with Jesus. That's what baptism in the water represents. That when you come out of the water, and when you come out of the water, you receive the new life of Jesus. You become a new... Let us turn to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2.
verse 12. Colossians 2 verse 12. It's very important. Colossians 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism. Having been buried with him in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. What does it represent? When we enter the water. When we enter the water, then it's we're saying that we have died with Christ in the water. Let us read verse 12 once again. Colossians 2 verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Just So just like we sacrifice ourselves on the cross by entering the water with Jesus, but it doesn't end with death for Jesus. Jesus rose again and had a new life. Similarly for us, in, through Jesus, in Jesus, we will receive a new life and we will be reborn. And that is what it represents when we come out from the water. So baptism in one word is the is the union with Jesus Christ the baptism is a is representing the union of with Jesus Christ but there are two things that you have to experience the first is the death on the cross and then the resurrection when you enter the water we die spiritually with Jesus we die on the cross with Jesus when we enter the water But while Jesus died on the cross, in three days he rose again from the dead. So similarly for us, we receive the new blood, the new life from Jesus, and we are reborn as well. And that is what this is representing to us. When we enter the water, we die with Jesus. When we come out of the water, we live through Jesus. We receive new life through Jesus. And this, what this is represented by what? This is represented by baptism. So I would like for people to understand the baptism better. So I will set a time and we'll go out to the Hudson River. We'll go to the Hudson River. And even though you have been baptized, in order to understand the original meeting, let us all go in the water and come back out. Let us go in the water. And when we go in the water, I have died with you, God. Let us think like that. I have died with you on the cross. And when we come out from the water, it is... Now, we are a new person through you, God. And we have received, through you, Jesus, through your sacrifice, we receive new life and new blood. That is what it represents, baptism. So water represents three things. The first is what? The Word of God. Water represents the Word of God. Water makes us clean, just like the Word. The Word makes us clean, like water. And point number two, water is repentance. Just like water washes away dirtiness, water washes away our spiritual dirtiness, which is our sins. So we need to repent continually to keep ourselves clean. And third, water represents baptism. When we are go in the water, we are dead with Jesus. And we come out of the water, we become living again through Jesus, and we start our new lives. And those are the three things represented by water. So when you enter the tent, when you enter through the gate, you pass the altar first. And after the altar, there is the water basin. The water basin, we have to wash our hands and feet in order to enter. In order to enter the temple, there are three things that we can see. In the north, on the right, there is a place for bread. And in the south side, there is a... There are all these things located here in the holy city. What is the first place that we need to see? We'll learn next week. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we thank you. Through the tabernacle that Moses built and through the 
we have been able to we have been able to learn the spiritual and physical meanings and redemptive lessons and please let all the things that we learned about water the lessons that we can learn through water let it be deep within our hearts and let us be able to go before you God and be able to carry out your duty that you've given to us the the gift of water through the gift of water through God's word we have become clean and we have been born again just as we have been made clean through Jesus' grace let each and every day be a life where we dedicate ourselves and all that we do to you God and we pray all these things will happen in the name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving we pray Amen